ambassador from the PRC to Singapore, friends and fellow citizens. English is my master language, and Chinese is my second, or rather my, my fourth or fifth language. So you will forgive me if I elaborate my ideas in English, and I will assume that most people will understand what I've said in English, and so my Chinese speech will be directed at the Chinese-speaking Singaporeans. Thirty years ago, I launched the Speak Mandarin campaign. Chinese students learned Mandarin in school. Unfortunately, they used to speak dialects amongst themselves, at home, and with their friends. A variety of dialects. So when I watch TV interviews on our Chinese TV channels in the 1960s and 70s, I found students and workers speaking Mandarin haltingly because they have not used it often. Mandarin has to be the common language of Chinese Singaporeans, regardless of their dialect groups. If we had left as a government the people to carry on with their language habits undirected, today Chinese Singaporeans will be speaking an adulterated mixture of Hokkien and Teochew, because that was the majority population that understood these two languages. That was the reason why I had to learn Hokkien and use Hokkien from 1961 till 1979 when I decided I was setting a bad example and stopped it. <laughs> to effectively promote Mandarin, we had to do some drastic things. So we closed down all dialect programs on radio and TV from 1979, except for one news channel in all dialects at 8 p.m. for those of the older generation who did not understand Mandarin. But over time, the older generation learned to understand Mandarin without being able to speak it, and that's good enough. As I said, I was setting a bad example, making speeches in Hokkien in the 1960s and 70s, because it reached the largest number of Singaporean Chinese. From 1979, 30 years ago, I launched the Speak Mandarin campaign and stopped speaking Hokkien and switched to Mandarin. And so today, Hokkien and Teochew will not be the predominant language, and adulterated Hokkien and Teochew is not the predominant language of Singapore's Chinese. The value of a language is its usefulness. Usefulness not just in Singapore, but in the wider world. If you speak Hokkien or Teochew or Cantonese or Hakka or Kehua or Hainanhua, you reach a few tens of millions in Fujian, Guangdong, Hainan, uh, Xiantou, maybe uh, if you speak Cantonese, you, you get by in Hong Kong. That's a Hong Kong problem. But with Mandarin, you can speak and be understood throughout China. Because the Chinese have moved from hundreds of different pronunciations of the Chinese into Putonghua. They don't call it Kuai because then it, you, you slight those dialects that did not, were not chosen as the standard. So they said Putonghua, the common language. As a result, it is now the main language of Chinese that the world recognizes. 
and overseas Chinese and all foreigners learn Mandarin, not Cantonese, Hokkien or whatever. Of course, if you go to a restaurant where you have the old generation Cantonese uh, waiters and chefs and you can speak Hui Kuang, Hui Xiang Kuang, Tung Hua, then it's extra warmth. But you are losing important neurons with data which should not be there. And like the computer, when you delete it, it doesn't really go away. It's there at the back. And you've got to go to the rubbish channel and say, destroy. And it's still disturbing your hard disk. The Chinese have set up 500 Confucian Confucius Institutes in many countries to teach Mandarin to millions of people around the world. You saw the uh, video just now that uh, Mr. Lim Chaufer showed you. That's the time to learn Chinese. I learned it as an adult and the roots are difficult to go deep. My children learned it at that age and theirs is like a transistor radio you switch on, it comes on. Mine is like an old valve radio, I switch on, I wait for the valves to warm up, <laughs> then it flows. So when I go to Taiwan, I go to China, first day, awkward. Second day, not too bad. By the end of the week, maybe one tea. Now, I understand how strong are the emotional feelings for one's mother tongue, that's the language. But in two, one, two, three generations, Mandarin can and will become our mother tongue. Because your brain cannot carry all this <laughs> different sounds, uh, different accents, different rank, uh, grammar rules, and so on. And the Chinese themselves are learning English with tremendous efforts and with great enthusiasm. Now, if Lim, Lim Shaofen, this is another one of our problems, see? My script here says, Lim Shao Hung. <laughs> Her Mandarin pronunciation is Lim Shaofen. It, you're just confusing yourself. So I, every time I have a, a new member of the staff, he has a name. He has got three names. One he calls himself George, David, whatever he, because it's easy for people to remember him. Then he's got his dialect name and he's got his Mandarin name. I have to waste megabytes here. <laughs> Remembering three different names for one person. If you use more than la one language, if you use one language frequently, you are using other languages less frequently. So the more languages you learn, the greater the difficulties of retaining them at a high level of fluency. I have learned, I have had to learn, and I've had to use six languages. Each one of them, at the time I used them, I became fluent in it. English, Malay, Latin, Japanese during the occupation, Mandarin and Hokkien. But because I work in English, English is my master language. In 1960s, 1970s, I can speak Hokkien a Hmong way like an Hmong person because I had to do it. But today my Hokkien has gone rusty and my Mandarin has improved. When I was speaking Hokkien, my Mandarin went down. If I have to make a speech in Hokkien now, I have to spend a few hours <laughs> writing it out and thinking, ah yes, how do I pronounce this word? 
My Japanese, I was a Japanese English translator for business in 1944-45. I had to learn it. Today it's gone. Yes, I can read the katakana, hiragana, I can read the kanji, patches here and there. I can spend six months and bring it back. <laughs> but something else will be pushed out. So please remember, you have nobody's brain is 1,000 gigabytes. <laughs> At the most, is 5 gigabytes. And the more you waste gigabytes with all these multiple names and grammatical rules and accents, the less you have of other things. And when you don't use a language, it goes rusty. And in linguistics, you call it language loss. Liu shi, yi yuan liu shi. Even back in 1959, when it first became the government, my colleagues in the cabinet and I could foresee a time when China would become a huge economic power. The size of the country, the size of the people, the quality of the civilization and the ability of the people. We are descendants of <laughs> landless peasants. My great grandfather came from Tapu because it was no future there. He made a small fortune, he went back. His wife did not want to go back with him, so that's why I'm here. My relatives in Tapu has given me my family tree. Ordinary people. Six generations up, there was a military secretary in Guangxi. That's <laughs> the only illustrious person. I think he was a Qin Shi, <laughs> but he didn't get into Beijing. Out of this background, we are able to do so many things. And China has 1,300 million people, poets, writers, scholars, artists, choreographers, dancers. You watch the Beijing Olympics opening. In one hour, Chang Yimou with his team projected to the world 5,000 years of Chinese scholarship and achievements presented in a succinct way using mass dancers, mass Tai Chi performances and so on. I was there sweating like mad in August. I was watching the reaction of the foreign leaders and I knew that they knew this was a country that's going to rise. 30 years since they opened up. Deng Xiaoping opened up in 1978 after he came to Singapore and saw how we used capitalist companies to bring about progress in our society. He opened up special economic zones. Little Singapore acted as a catalyst because he visited us, saw it, and in 1992, in his southern tours in Nanshin, he said, study Singapore and do better than them. And they are. We greened the island, the Beijing Olympics, from the airport to the stadium to the city center, a mass of green, 40 million flower pots, you just consider, 40 million flower pots, all flowering at the same time. <laughs> you know how difficult it is every Chinese New Year, our floral gardens to get the flowers bloom up at the same time. Here, 40 million flower pots blooming at the same time. But so many farmers with green fingers. <laughs> what do we have? We are flowering bushes, so you don't have to change them. 
So you get, so you get laborers from Bangladesh, India, whatever, and they trim it, and then the flowers come out when the season comes on. But they change flowers, lilies, gladiolus, roses. Putung Airport to Putung <laughs> is greener than Singapore. They watched us. They sent teams to study us. They said, ah, not so difficult. I got more manpower. I'll do it. Our choice of English has enabled us to make the fast growth. But with China's rise, parents and students no longer complain of the burden of learning Chinese. It's a difficult language to learn. It's without spelling, without phonetics. It's got characters, pictographs, ideographs. How do we overcome this? Is it easy? No. Can it be done? Yes. Many Singaporeans with only AO standard of Mandarin, Hawaii, second, second language, with a P4, P5, P6, which means they just scrape through so they can get to university. They have gone to China and in a total immersion as adults, but with that background, after six months to one year, they speak fluent Mandarin because they can ramp up. And I have innumerable emails to thank me. It says, thank you for forcing me to learn Mandarin. I'm now here. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to come here. 